On behalf of Pastor Joe L. Newsom and First Lady Annette Newsom, welcome to Be Ye Holy Ministries. Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, let thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We ask that you give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of all our sins. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all that which is evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and forever. Let us all say amen. Truly, we want to thank you, amen, once again for joining us on this great day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I come saying happy Father's Day to all of you all that God has blessed to be fathers because I want you to know today, everybody is not a father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Say again, everybody is not a father. I believe it was on last Father's Day last year. I asked a question where are you a father or are you just a sperm donor? Amen. Praise the Lord. But everybody is not a father. So to the fathers, amen. I'm not talking about those that sire. A sire is a man, an animal that parent other animals. I'm talking about fathers. Amen. I want to say happy fathers. Amen. Happy Father's Day to those that are truly fathers. And Father, I thank you now in the name of Jesus how you allowed me to stand before these thy people. And I'm mad that you let me decrease now that the word of God may increase in the name of Jesus. It's my prayer that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart may be acceptable on that side, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm asking, Lord, let your word go out, O oh God, and accomplish that which you send it. In Jesus' precious name we pray that all God's people say, Amen. And so I want to talk to the fathers today. Amen. I want to talk to the fathers today. I want to encourage the father. I have been privileged, amen, to be a father for 34 years. And as I did a self-assessment myself, I found out that I, I've been a father longer than I've been living. Is that all right? Amen. Praise the Lord. And it's truly wonderful. Amen. Praise the Lord to be a father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Like I said, there's a difference between being a father and just a sperm donor. I can't get nobody to help me now. Amen. Praise the Lord. But a father is one that is always present. Amen. Always present in the life of his child. I can't get nobody to help me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so I want to thank you for you all. Amen. That value. Amen. Praise the Lord. The privilege that God has given you to be a father because everybody can't be a father and as good a job your mother's doing single mothers are doing you cannot be a father there's just something that God has put in us men amen praise the Lord that qualify us to be fathers amen and so I want to talk to you amen praise the Lord from the book of Proverbs the first chapter and also from Mark the fifth chapter the message is going to be coming from Mark, the fifth chapter. But I want to encourage the sons that are listening, amen, praise the Lord, out of Proverbs, amen, praise the Lord, uh -huh, the first chapter, as our Sunday school lesson been talking about wisdom. I want to encourage you from Proverbs 1 and 7, fear the Lord, amen, is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instructions, amen. I'm going to say it again, fools. <coughs> despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear, amen, the instructions of thy father, amen, and forsake not the law of thy mother, amen. So you see here, just look at the eighth verse, it is implied that, amen, in a family that there is a father and a mother. I can't get nobody to help me. Two women cannot, uh-uh, no, 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 I don't care what society says, amen, some of y'all women have an identity crisis and you think you're men, amen, just come on to the altar and let me pray for you. Some of you fathers, amen, some of you men don't even know you men, you think you're women. I can't get nobody to help me, but will the real men please stand up? And so my son, 
Hear the instruction of my father and forsake not the law of thy mother for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, uh, consent thy not here. Wisdom is talking about, amen, the young man that's grown up in the world. Amen. Praise the Lord where, amen, sin is prevalent as it is today. He said, if sinners entice thee, do not consent. This world is filled with temptations, my sons. Amen. Sinful individual around us and they uh, encourage us to sin with them. But today's scripture says, consent thy not. Ignore the negative peer pressure. Can you say amen? Uh-huh. And so, amen, I want to talk, amen, being a godly father in an ungodly world. I want to talk about being a godly father in an ungodly world. Somebody repeat after me. Being a godly father in an ungodly world. Coming from Matthew, the fifth chapter, amen, praise the Lord. I want to use Jairus as an example of a godly father. Is that all right? Out of Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh -huh, looking at the 21st verse, it says, and when Jesus was passed over again by the ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Uh huh. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thrung him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go to the 35th verse. Uh huh. And while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Uh huh. Praise the Lord. Why troubles thou the master any further? Yes, amen. Praise the Lord. Thy daughter is dead. Why troubles thy master any further? And as soon as Jesus heard, somebody shout heard, as soon as Jesus heard, uh huh, the words that were spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, say Peter and James. Amen. Praise the Lord. And John, the brothers of James. Amen. Uh, he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and see the tomah. Amen. And them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why makest ye this ado and weep? The damsel. Amen. It's not dead, but sleepeth. Amen. But they laughed him to scorn. But when he put them all out, you've got to understand. You got there's some folks in your life you just have to put out. You got to put out the naysayers. You got to put out the doubters. I can't get nobody help. There's just some folks in your life that you are going to have to put out. That's why I begin with Proverbs. If sinners, amen, entice thee, consent thy not. There's some folks in your life that's going to try to entice you to do the wrong thing. You just need to put them out. I can't get what help me but when he had put them all out he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel once again amen we see that both there's a father and a mother I can't get nobody to help me not a father and a man thinking he's a woman I can't get nobody to help me but a father and a mother uh-huh and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying and he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her tell her to come I amen and praise the Lord which is being interpreted damsel so I say unto thee, arise, amen, and straight the way that damsel rose and walked, for she was the, at the, of the age of 12 years, amen, and they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given to her to eat. I want to talk about, amen, being a godly father in an ungodly world. you got to understand raising godly children in an ungodly world still remains a challenge today. Especially when you got young girls don't know they're girls. When you got young boys don't know they boys. Amen. And this society is trying to redefine gender. I'm sorry. The Bible already declared what gender is. Can I keep talking? The Bible. Can I go to the Bible? If you don't like it, tear it out your Bible. Ball it up and stump on. Let's go to Genesis. 
The Bible talks about in the beginning, amen, praise the Lord, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Can we go to Genesis 1 and 26 now? And God said, let us make man, not woman, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the count on over all the earth and over every creeping things that creepeth upon the earth. Can we say amen? And the Bible let us know a little bit further. Amen. Praise the Lord. After God amen. Praise the Lord had done that. Amen. He looked at Adam. He looked at all the creatures that he had created. Amen. Praise the Lord and saw that Adam was the only one that did not have a mate. Can I keep talking here? Amen. Praise the Lord. So we find here Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord said that it is not good. Can I keep reading here? For man to be alone. And so God blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the Bible says, Amen. In the second chapter of Genesis, I'm going to just, I'm jumping around to get you here. Amen. In second chapter of Genesis, the, the seventh verse, and the Lord called uh, God formed man of the dust and of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul. Can we go a little bit further now? Amen. In the 18th verse, and the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a help meet, not a help eat. Uh -huh. I will make him a help Help meet a man for him. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we find out, amen, praise the Lord, that God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. I'm in Genesis 2 and 21. God caused a man deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of Adam's ribs. That's why, amen, praise the Lord. He took one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh and stayed thereof. And the rib which God took, had taken from man, he made what? One man. I can't and get nobody help me. Do I have any women in the audience today? He took a rib from man and made a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam, a man, said, a man, this is now bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In the beginning, God made male and female. God made Adam and Eve, not no Adam and Steve. I can't get nobody help me now. Amen. Praise the Lord. So raising godly children in an ungodly world still remains a challenge today and a burden and responsibility of all of us that are parenting today, especially fathers, amen, praise the Lord, because if you go with me to the book of Ephesians, amen, praise the Lord, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, amen, praise the Lord, as it children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, honor thy father and thy mother, I can't get nobody to help me, here you go again, father and mother, I can't get nobody to help me, male and female. Uh, Y'all don't light me up here. Man and woman, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment we're promised. Now, you don't like it. You can tear it out your Bible, ball it up, and stump on it. But that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, do I have any fathers out here? Ye fathers, amen, praise the Lord, provoke not your children, uh-huh, unto wrath. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture, in the training, and admonition of the Lord. Can I keep teaching here? Amen. Fathers, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to train our children up in the way they should go, that when they get old, they will not depart. Let's go to Proverbs 22. I don't want to tell you, oh, Shondo, hallelujah. I want to make sure you get the word for yourself. In Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, in the sixth verse, it gives us a responsibility to train up the child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I need to know, do I have any real fathers out there today? Please do not shirk and shun your responsibility. See, this commandment is the desire of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Praise the Lord who sees godly offspring. God is looking for godly offspring, but you can't get godly offspring from ungodly 
parents, let me slow down. I need to teach you. I need to teach you. Amen. You cannot get godly. Amen. Praise the Lord. Offsprings from ungodly parents. Amen. Uh-huh. So this commitment is the desire of God who sees godly offsprings. Amen. Uh-huh. From the conventional marriage of a man and a woman. But we got to deal with the ungodly influence. Amen. Praise the Lord. We must deal. We must deal with the ungodly influence in the world. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because they're going to try to persuade us. Amen. That a woman can be a man and that a man can be a woman. God, by somebody ought to say the devil is a lie. Women got to learn how to embrace their femininity and men got to learn how to embrace their masculinity. I can't get nobody to help me now. I am glad that God made me a man and you ought to be glad God made you a man. You all that are fathers, you ought to be glad that God made you a man and you all that are mothers, you ought to be proud and happy that God made you a woman. We live in a crazy mixed up society. <coughs> We live in a crazy mixed up society, in a crazy and mixed up world, amen, that is often anything but godly. Can I say that again? We live in a crazy and mixed up world. We live in a crazy and mixed up society that is often anything, somebody I'll shout anything, but godly. Saints need to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. Saints need to be wise to the fact that our secular world, our secular culture, amen, is trying to redefine what a father is. They try to redefine what a man is, but I know what my Bible tells me, amen, praise the Lord. But they're trying to redefine society, is trying to redefine what a man is and what a woman is. Can you say amen? And so saints, we need to be wise to the fact that our secular culture is trying to influence us and our children to reject the true and living God uh -huh, and live however they please. Amen. This ungodly and sinful desire is nothing new, but we need to deserve these powers of influences. Kabashando, hallelujah. We've been duped. We've been distracted. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is all a ruse by the devil. Amen. A deception, a sensational window dressing. Amen. Our culture wars on gender, abortion, and militant LGBT lobbying, amen, Dr uh, drag queen children, uh -huh. Christian bakers, free speech, religion and otherwise, gun control, can I keep talking here, uh-huh, uh -huh. even the skirmish of the border of conflict, there is a full scale assault upon defending a righteous nation to a godly father, mm-hmm, these issues distract and defy <coughs> De depreciating biblical masculinity as an outdated concept. But I love the biblical masculinity. I love to see Samson, amen, praise the Lord. I love to see David take on the Goliath. I love to see and be around strong men. But these issues distract and divide, depreciating biblical masculinity as being an outdated concept, symbolic by a bygone authority or power of the Father, amen. Meanwhile, our nation is systematically constantly Oh, uh, Shonda, it's amen. It's castrating men. Uh -huh. The nation, our nation we live in, is systematically castrating men. Amen. Praise the Lord. Trying to redefine what a man is. We demon now today, society has demonized masculinity. Amen. Suppressing the slightest hint of masculine aggression in young boys. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's natural for young boys to wrestle. I can't get nobody to help me. It's a natural thing for young boys to wrestle and to fight. Amen. Praise the Lord. But now our society we're living in is trying to suppress the slightest hint of masculinity in our brothers, in our young men with a few good examples to emulate young men go one or two ways, submit to being neutered. That's what's happening now. We have neutered a lot of young men. They don't know if they are men. Y'all don't like me up in here. When you got a man thinking he is a woman, look at somebody and say he been neutered. 
Now, don't be scared to say it. He's been neutered and become a hollow out shell of a man immersed in pornography, uh huh, maybe video games, lash out of the oppression of women. These days, the culture ideal for manhood has become the homosexual man. I can't get nobody to help me. One who opposes the captivity, but not the propensity to reproduce to father a man. See, men, uh huh, praise the Lord, should be masculine. I can't get nobody help me amen praise the lord men love to shoot basketball amen praise the lord uh-huh uh-huh men love to play football i can't get nobody help me men love to do hard work uh-huh but now they have neutered our young men when men don't know when boys don't know they are designed to be a man i can't get nobody help me they have neutered our young men uh-huh you see satan knows all too well the power of a godly father and what's missing in the home are godly fathers uh-huh fathers to the church amen uh, god calls godly men to lead the church uh, it's sad now you can't hardly find no men in the church i can't get nobody help me the church is more full of women than it is men do you not see how the devil has to try to redefine what what a godly man is and what a godly father is but God calls godly men to lead the church in first Timothy the third chapter now and Titus the first chapter you see what God called godly men huh, to lead the church huh? he commissioned elders to lead in God and to shepherd a man huh? and to protect the flock of God and to protect the people of God huh? the church elders uh huh I mean I like this right now huh? but the church elders must be the husband of one wife it's something wrong when we got pastors huh Warning from one wife to another wife. Y'all don't help nobody shun them. Huh? They trading the wives in like you're trading a car. Y'all don't like me up in here. Huh? But God, huh, Shandu, huh, is looking for uh, um, huh, some godly fathers. Huh? God is looking for some godly men. Can I keep teaching here? Huh? Matter of fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah, huh, I believe it was around the sixth chapter of Jeremiah, huh, where God told them to run to and fro up and down and see if they can find a man. God had a problem finding a man. Not Jeremiah the sixth chapter, but Jeremiah the fifth chapter. He said, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, God had a problem finding a man. And some of y'all women that seek to be married have a problem finding a man. Because somebody done turned them out. Y'all don't like me up in here. But I didn't need to know do we have any real men out there today huh? that God out of shine, huh? is looking for some godly men huh? God is looking for godly fathers huh? because fathers lead the church huh? can I keep talking here and so the church elder must be the husband of one wife, literally a one woman man. It's something wrong when you follow a pastor and he got a sweetheart on the side a man praise the Lord huh? there's something wrong mm-hmm and this is something that culture want us to accept. A father, a godly man, he must be a have reputable character. Uh huh. Praise the Lord. Huh? Can I keep talking here? Uh huh. Uh -huh. I know Papa was a rolling stone, huh? and everywhere he laid his hat was his home. Huh? But somebody got to kill that spirit. Huh? A oh, glory to God. Huh? You must have a reputable character. Huh? He must manage and lead his household well along with his wife and his children huh? first timothy three and five say he must be a godly father huh? can i keep talking here huh? oh glory to god huh? but what's happening now huh? that we are missing men amen huh? godly men huh? because the bible says in first timothy three and five huh? for if a man not a woman huh? if a man know not how to rule his whole house huh? how should he take care of the church of god huh? can i preach up in here huh? and so I want you to know he must be a godly father huh? now nowhere do God restrict single or childless men from service huh? but if you're looking for a man praise the Lord huh? if you're looking for an example <coughs> you need to look at some godly men 
That's uh huh. He manages house well. He manages home well. Indicates how well uh huh. He might manage the house of God. It's one thing, Amen. If your house is all tore up from the floor up, if your home is in a chaotic situation, and then you want to get behind the pulpit and manage the church, look at somebody and say the devil is a lie. A godly man must be know how to manage his home house well. It indicates how he will manage the house of God in the things of God. God, huh? If he cannot manage his own home, huh? he cannot manage the finances of his home. Huh? How is he going to manage the finances of the church? Huh? Uh-huh. How can he be trusted with such responsibility huh? as God likened his church to a household? Huh? Godly men are the fathers of the church. Huh? Yet most men sit in content. Huh? They just content a man huh? in their excess as idle and lifeless distortion huh? of what God has called all them to be a man. They flee the feminized church in droves, leaving any practice of spirituality to the wives and to the women. Further emasculating the church, a man, huh? entire denomination, huh? ignore the authority of the scripture. Huh? And now they have gone and set up women pastors huh? over churches, a man. Huh? Y'all don't like me up in here, huh? but I heard the Bible said huh? that God designed the man to be the head. Huh? God designed the men to lead, huh? but men are missing in the church now. Huh? And so, a man, they flee the feminized church in droves. Huh? leaving any practice of spirituality huh, to the wives and to the women of the church. Huh, further emasculating the church. Huh, women are left holding the bag, so to speak. Uh-huh, huh, this is not what God intended huh, when he created man. Huh, can I keep preaching here? Huh, the Bible, go back to Genesis. Huh, the Bible, when God created man, huh, he said, let them have dominion. Huh, huh, glory to God over the fish of the sea, huh, over the fowl of the am huh, over the cow and over all the earth huh, and over every creeping thing that creeped upon the earth huh. so God created man in his own image huh, and in the image of God created he him male and female huh. I can't get nobody to help him huh. oh, glory to God huh. so I need to know a man praise the Lord huh. are you a father huh. oh, glory to God huh. thank you Jesus huh. God is looking huh, for godly men uh huh. Godly men. Uh huh. God is looking for godly men. Huh? God is looking for godly fathers huh? to lead His church huh? and taking the gospel to the nation. Amen. Huh? Do I have any godly men out here? Huh? God dispatched godly fathers huh? to lead the assault against the very gates of hell. Huh? The Bible says huh? in Matthew 16 and 18, huh? Peter, thou art rock, huh? and upon this rock I'm going to get build my church. Huh? And the gates of hell shall not prevail. Huh? Can I keep on preaching here? Huh? God designed huh, for the godly men a huh, oh, glory to God huh, to proclaim liberty huh, to the captive huh, and to set them that are bound free. Amen. Huh? I need to know huh, where is the power huh, of the godly father. Huh? I refuse hallelujah huh, to give my power huh, to the devil. Amen. Huh? I'm so so glad, hallelujah, that God made me the man that I am. Oh, glory to God. But fathers, fathers, I want to encourage you today. Beware, oh, glory to God, that fathers have become an endangered species. The society is trying to neuter the young men. Society is trying to castrate the young men. I come to tell you today devil is a lie. Huh? Will the fathers huh? please stand up? Huh? I need some fathers today. Huh? I need some Holy Ghost filled fathers. Huh? Some Holy Ghost filled men. Huh? That's not ashamed. Huh? Oh Lord. Huh? To be called a man. Huh? Oh glory to God. Huh? Fathers 
We need fathers for the children. Huh? With uh, what a man does in his home huh? is equally important, amen. Huh? If not more important than what he does in the public arena, huh? is oh Lord Jesus, huh? I'm gonna say it again, amen. Huh? What a father, huh? what a man does in his home huh? is equally important, amen. Huh? Matter of fact, what a father does in his home huh? and what a man does in his home huh? is more important than what he does on the job. Huh? It's more important than what he does in the public huh? is more important than what he does in the church huh? because the family huh, is the bedrock of the church. Huh? The family huh, is the building block of the church. Huh? Can I keep talking here? Huh? The family huh, is the foundation huh, of a godly nation. Huh? Few things indicate huh, the condition of a nation huh, more so than the state of his family. Huh? A few things display huh, the power huh, of a godly the father, huh? more than the role of the family. Huh? God, huh? I love you, Jesus. Huh? God has entrusted huh? the future of the church huh? in the hands huh? of godly men. Huh? God huh? has entrusted huh? the future of the church huh? in the hands of godly fathers. Huh? Uh, glory to God huh? that they will be ministers huh? and that they will minister to the families. Huh? This is a great gospel issue. Huh? And you may or must not evade this call. Huh? I'm so glad huh, that God called me huh, to be a father. Huh? God ordained me huh, to be a father huh, for such a time as this. Huh? Can I keep on preaching here today? Huh? Children, huh? oh glory to God. Huh? Children, huh? inherit their faith of their parents. Huh? Really, they inherit the faith of the father. Huh? The father huh? that God called. Huh? God is calling the fathers. Huh? Men, huh? God is calling you the father. <coughs> I'm going to say again, men, God is calling you to father. Let me see if I can slow down just a little bit. In Psalms, the 127th division of Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 127. A very familiar passage of scripture, one I quoted in my younger years. Amen. Praise the Lord. In Psalms 127 and 3, it says, Lo, children are an, inherit are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Uh huh. As errors are in the hands of mighty men, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that has quibble full of children. They shall not be ashamed, for they shall speak with the, they may, they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And so here, the Lord has equipped us with two powerful weapons, two great weapons. Uh huh. Amen. Praise the Lord for this cutthroat spiritual battle that we are in. He has given us the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God is a weapon amen, in the hands of the warrior. But he has filled our quiver with arrows. Look what he says here. Uh huh. As arrows are in the hands of the mighty man, so are the children of the youth. God has given the father arrows. Amen. He has filled our quiver with arrows. Our children, our sons, our daughters, our children are like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Uh huh. The Bible in our children, the weapons of our godly father. Would you put the sword of the spirit into the hands of your son? And this is the power of godly father. Can I keep talking here? Reality confronts as most fathers relinquish the responsibility to make discipline disciples of the father reality confronts this though uh-huh as most fathers relinquish uh-huh the responsibility to make disciples of their son uh-huh either leaving it to the church or neglecting it all together. It's not the church's job, my brothers, to raise your sons and your daughters. I can't get all help me. They do play an important role. They do play an important part. But it's not the church's responsibility to raise your children. That's your responsibility. <coughs> Uh -huh. This is the great gospel issue. Most believers convert between the age of 18, amen, by the age of 18, and they are very few adult converts. If a young man leaves home before conversion, if a young man, young man leaves home before even being introduced to Jesus, chances are he would die without knowing Jesus, amen. The spiritual practice of the father is vital. The spiritual practice of the father is important. The spiritual practice of the father above everything else 
determine, somebody else shout determine, determine the future spiritual practice of a child. Amen. Praise the Lord. In 1994, a study was done. Uh huh. Praise the Lord. If a father does not go to church, no matter how faithful the wife is to her devotion, only one out of 50 will become a regular worshiper of God. That's how much influence God has given the father. And that's why I challenge you men, where the real men, please stand up. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh -huh. Secular psychology concurs, a man prays, a child's psychological representation of his father is intimately connected to his understanding of God. And I know that's be true because the only God I knew was the God I saw in my father and the God I saw in my grandfather and I didn't want to have nothing to do with that God. I can't get nobody to help me. And so the psychological representation of his father is intimately connected to his understanding of who God is. And so when I saw the God of my father, the God of my grandfather, I was like, if that's God, I don't want to have nothing to do with it. I can't get nobody to help me. And you've got to understand men, amen, praise the Lord, before your children get to know Jesus for themselves, the only Jesus they know is the Jesus they see in you. Uh-huh. And so once a child is disappointed, it, it disappointed or lo loses respect for the earthly father, belief in the heavenly father becomes impractical, but it's not impossible. I'm going to say it again. Once a child is disappointed in or loses respect for the earthly father, belief in the heavenly father becomes impractical, but not impossible. Amen. It's almost impossible because as for myself, amen, the only vision I had of God is what I saw in my father and my grandfather. And I was like, if that's God, I don't want him. I can't get nobody to help me. Amen. And I turned my back on God. And when I say I turned my back on God, I turned my back on the God I seen in my parent, my father and my grandfather because that was the only God I knew. Can I keep talking here? Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. And so the younger a man, the more likely he is to have a poor relationship with his father. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh huh. And so though the connection is not firmly established, the younger man is also less likely to believe in God. And that was me. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, had, I, did, I, I did not believe in God. I did not believe in God, amen, praise the Lord. And so because of what I seen displayed in the only two male role models in my life, my father and my grandfather, I can't get nobody to help me. So you've got to understand that there are certain qualities, somebody shout qualities, there are certain qualities of a godly father. God, talk about some of the qualities. Thank you, first lady, amen. See, today is a special day for many of us men here today, amen. Today has been set aside to honor fathers. Amen. Being a father is one of the greatest joys of my life. I can't get nobody to help me. Yeah, I enjoy preaching. I enjoy pastoring. I enjoy being a husband. Amen. But being a father, I remember when all five of my children was born, I was there. Those were some great moments. I can go to my closet right now and pull out the photo albums and I see myself holding my baby girls. I see myself holding my baby boys. Amen. Praise the Lord. You talk about those were some of the greatest moments of my life. I can't get nobody to help me. And I'm blessed to have five children and one granddaughter. Is that all right? And very thankful for what Amen. For that wonderful opportunity that God has given me to be a father. And I don't want to mess it up. Look at yourself and say, I don't want to mess it up. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. But as I consider the blessings, amen, I am also reminded of the responsibility of a father. I didn't know how to be a father when I got married. I can't know about Shondo. I didn't even really know how to be a husband. I can't get nobody to help me. But thank God for godly men. Somebody shout godly men. Thank God for godly men that God placed in my life. Thank God for the late Dr. Robert L. Cook. Amen. Praise the Lord. A very inspirational and example to young men on what it is to be a man what it is to be a husband and what it is to be a father. Can't keep talking here. And so, uh -huh. and so amen, uh, I'm reminded of the responsibility that God has given us as godly fathers. God has entrusted us with a unique position along with the expectation to fulfill our obligation to the family. 
Can I keep talking here? And so our lesson text here, amen, coming from Matthew, I'm going to get there, coming from Matthew, talking about J.R. Our lesson text reveal a man who serves a, as a role model for fathers. I know that when y'all probably looked at J. Irish, you had to look at J. Irish as a role model of a father. But let me pick apart. Can I pick apart Matthews 5, 21 through 24? If you do, y'all allow me to pick apart Matthews 5, 21 through 43. Uh -huh. Although time and culture change, the responsibility of fathering has not changed. I'm going to say it again. Although time and culture changes, the responsibility of a father does not change the quality of Jairus possessed a man then ought to be possessed in the fathers of today. Uh -huh. What kind of father are you? What kind of father are we? Amen. Are we striving to be the best father we can uh, be for our children? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I think I got a button at home from one of my daughters. She gave me the father of the year button. I can't get nobody to help me. I should hit it on today. I would encourage you to examine your heart today as we consider the qualities of of a godly father. Let's go, let's go, let's go back to Matthews now. Can we go back to Matthews? Matthews, amen, praise the Lord. The, I mean, not Matthews, Mark, praise the Lord, the fifth chapter. And behold, there cometh a ruler of the synagogues, J. Irish by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. And behold, there come one of the rulers of the synagogues, J. Irish by name. And when he saw him, he fell at at his feet. We find that Jairus was a ruler in the synagogue. That means he had some prestige. Amen. Praise Lord. He was a man of position. Amen. Praise Lord. He was a man of authority and power. He was a ruler. He was one of the rulers of the synagogue. He had worked hard and achieved a prominent place in society. He was regarded as a man of influence. Is that all right? In charge of local assemblies at the synagogue. And at first glance, all that seems wonderful. But Jairus was a man. Somebody say a man. A man of dedication and perseverance. These are good qualities that we as fathers need to have. <coughs> Jairus was a man of dedication and perseverance. Uh-huh. And like I said, these are good qualities that we need to have that, and these are good qualities to possess. But we need to understand that he is now in a difficult situation. When Jairus come to Jesus, he find himself in a complex situation. His only daughter, according to Luke, a man was dying. Uh-huh. His only daughter, according to a man, a man praise the Lord, uh -huh, was dying. Amen. Praise the Lord. And what do you do when the only child you have is dying? I can't get nobody to help me. Amen. Praise the Lord. What do you do when the only child you have is dying? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And so we find here, uh huh, praise the Lord, that Jesus was called by J. Irish. And so Luke put it this way. Uh-huh. That in Luke, the eighth chapter. Mm-hmm. Just, I just wanted you to understand that this is the only daughter he had. This is the only daughter. In Luke, the eighth chapter, in the 41st verse, it said, Behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come to his house. For he had, what? One only daughter. One only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she lying a dying. She lay a dying. But as he went, the people thrung him. We'll get back to that later. So we find here, amen, praise the Lord. Uh -huh. he, his only daughter, according to Luke, was dying. And all the prestige and power he possessed could not help his daughter. Mm-hmm. And so he heard about this man named Jesus. I just need to know, have anybody heard about Jesus? Uh-huh. Amen. Uh-huh. I got to know Jesus 38 years ago. And he heard about a man named Jesus who he believed could heal his daughter. But when Jesus was no longer accepted by the religious rulers, he was viewed as a blasphemer who claimed to be the son of God. The Pharisees desired to get rid of Jesus. He was upsetting their religious ways. He was upsetting their culture. He was upsetting their tradition. Yeah, Jesus did all of that. 
He was upsetting their ways of religion. If Jairus went to Jesus, what about those with him who worshiped? He would likely lose all that he worked hard for to achieve. In other words, by Jairus going to Jesus, after Jesus was being rejected and ostracized and criticized, Jairus risked losing his prominent position. I can't get nobody to help me. I'm talking about the qualities of a father. Amen. Jairus said, forget that. You can take my title. You can take my prestige. But I'm going to go see Jesus. I can't get nobody to help me. Oh, that's a whole new message in itself. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. We try to hold on to some kind of image. We don't want them to, we don't want to appear to be weak. Amen. And somebody says, some years ago that a man God is for the weak people well I come to tell you I'm not a, I'm a long way from being weak a man praise the Lord and Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me let me get back let me get back let me get back let me get back uh-huh and so J. Irish was at risk of losing all he had worked hard to achieve uh-huh I'm talking about the quality of a godly father now J. Irish makes a profound decision uh-huh. He decided to put his family ahead of his own personal uh-huh achievements. He decided, he made by Shonda, to put his family above his position, his prestige, and the power he held in the synagogue. Isn't that all right? Uh-huh. He said, forget all that, man. Uh-huh. And so J.R. makes his daughter. His priority of his life. I need to know, fathers, are your children your priority? Uh -huh. If your children are your priority, nobody have to beg you. Nobody have to make you pay child support. I can't get nobody to help me. And that's if you had a child outside the bonds of marriage. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh huh. Nobody have to beg you. Nobody have to make you do what a father does. Do what is right by a father. So that's why I asked the question: Are you a father or a sire? I can't get nobody to help me. Are you a father or a sperm donor? I can't get nobody to help me. Uh huh. Glory to God. You got to understand. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh huh. J. Iris makes a profound decision. He decides to put his family ahead of his own personal achievement. J. Iris makes his daughter the pride of his life. He was willing to risk it all to get her to Jesus. Hallelujah. And I just need to know how many fathers are willing to risk it all to get our children to Jesus. I can't get nobody to help me now. Men, what a lesson for us to learn from today. Uh-huh. Our position, our prestige, our places of business and our accomplishment uh -huh, should not come at the expense of our family. A lot of times we're looking for prestige. We're looking for power. We're looking for recognition at the cost of losing the family. The Bible asks, what shall a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Now, but I want to know what shall a profit a man huh, if he gains a man, praise the Lord, huh, prestige and position huh, and come home and lose his family. Huh? What shall you give in exchange for your family? Huh? I want the devil to know, amen, praise the Lord. Huh? I love being a godly father, a hum, glory to God. Huh? And so our position, our prestige, uh -huh, our places of business and accomplishment huh, should not come at the expense of our families. Uh -huh, huh? Uh, glory to God. Huh? Some of us have lost our families huh? trying to climb what they call the corporate ladder. Huh? I'm so glad, amen, huh? If my family could not go up that ladder with me, huh, I could not go up that ladder. Huh? I'll come by to tell you huh, the qualities of being huh, a godly father. Huh? Oh, glory to God. Huh? We need to understand and fulfill huh, our obligation to our families huh, as godly fathers. Getting our children in the presence of Jesus huh, will be the greatest thing we can ever achieve. Huh? A godly father will have his priorities in order. Huh? God first, huh? then the family huh? and then self, amen huh? can I keep preaching here huh? I just need to know, amen praise the Lord, huh? do I have any godly fathers huh? that's observing on today huh? oh, glory to God, huh? and then look at the father's petition look at J. Iris petition in the 22nd verse, he said, look here, uh -huh. he, when he fell at the feet of Jesus, he besought him greatly, saying, my little daughter lieth 
at the point of death. Other words, my daughter got one foot in the grave and one foot out of the grave. Huh? She's laying at the point of death and I pray thee to come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. J. Iris makes his way through the crowd. Look at it, look at it now. You got to understand according to Luke, the Bible said they thronged him. Uh-huh, praise the Lord. But that did not stop him. Look at Luke, amen, praise the Lord. Let's go back to Luke. Luke, the eighth chapter, the 42nd verse. Uh-huh, for he had only one daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was lying there dying. But as he went, people thronged him. They, they, was getting, they was getting in the way of him. Isn't it something when you try to get to Jesus, how folks and the devil will throw things in the way? Amen. Praise the Lord. But I'm talking to the fathers today. Don't let nothing stop you from getting to Jesus because your children are going to need to know who Jesus is. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so we look here. Uh-huh. As J. Iris makes his way to the crowd or the people in search of Jesus, he has decided that he must get to Jesus for his daughter. Fathers, we got to get to Jesus on behalf of our families. Don't let the devil take control of your family. The Bible, give me that scripture first, lady. They say, you got to understand the devil got the first bind, the stronghold. Amen, praise the Lord. And you as men, being masculinity, being masculine, amen, praise the Lord, you got to understand, amen, if the devil can bind you up and, for, and get you to forget who you are, he will destroy your family. Mm-hmm. And so he decided that he must get to Jesus for his daughter. He has come to a plea of help from Jesus. Imagine a scene as he pushes the crowd and up ahead the crowd, amen, praise the Lord, has broken. And there in the midst, and then in the midst is Jesus, the one he has come to see. There are a couple of things worth mentioning about J. Iris' petition, amen. Let's go to Matthew's 12. Matthew, the 12th chapter. Y'all got me sweating up in here. Matthew's 12. Uh-huh. Let's look here. Matthew's 12 and 29. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? So you got to understand godly fathers, godly men, you cannot let the devil come into your house and run havoc in your home. You got to let the devil know that's not going to stop. That's not going to start here. That, -uh. that stops right here. And so the, in order for the devil to run havoc with your home, he got to first get to what? The stronghold. The man represents masculinity. The man represents strength. And the only way the devil can run havoc with your home is if you cower and become neutered. I can't get nobody to help me. The only way the devil can come in amen, and run havoc in your home if you allow him to castrate you and you don't even know you're a man. I can't get nobody to help me. And some of y'all got these, uh, y'all might not like me up in here. Some of y'all got these uh, John Henry women. Uh -huh. Some of y'all men, I pray for y'all men. Some of y'all married to those John Henry women. Amen. They bench pressing about 700 pounds. Amen. Praise the Lord. And when they say jump, you say how high you want me to jump. I can't get nobody to help me. Amen. Praise the Lord. But a real woman wants a real man. I can't get nobody to help me. I can say it again. A real woman wants a real man. And I didn't need to know where the real men please stand up. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so the devil got the first bind the stronghold, which is the man. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. In order to take control of my house, he got the he got the bamboozle me. But I let the devil know he can't have my house. He can't have my home. He cannot have my family. He cannot have my children. He cannot have my grandchildren. I fast and pray. I'm like Job. I'm making sacrifices on behalf of my children. I can't get nobody to help me. And so look here. There's a couple of things I want to mention here about J. Iris' petition. His humility. First of all, look at J. Iris' humility. One thing that keeps us men from coming to Jesus, we don't want to humble ourselves. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. But look at J. Iris' humility in the 22nd verse. The Bible said he fell at his feet. I can't get nobody to help me. 
he fell at his feet. The word fell means he descended from a higher position, from a higher place to a lower one. I need to know, do I have any real men that want to descend and come on down so Jesus can save and deliver you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Here is Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, a man who, a man who has other in submission to him, bowing at the feet of Jesus. Uh-huh. He has laid aside his pride. I can't get nobody to help me. The reason why some of God, some of my Shonda, the reason why some of you men can't do anything from God because your pride, amen, is preventing you. And so he laid aside his pride in his dignity. He laid aside his prestige. He, he laid aside his position. His family, his daughter was more important to be calling a bishop, was more important to be calling a pastor, was more important than calling an elder. He laid aside that prestige. He laid aside. You talking about humility. One of the good qualities of a godly man is humility. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. He wasn't concerned with the opposition or the prejudice of others. Uh-huh. He has put his position on the line. We need fathers who would do that today. Mm-hmm. We need fathers who would do that today. We need men of God, godly men, who will put their position on the line for the sake of the family. We need to come humbly before the Lord in prayer and supplication for our children. Our family need fathers who will spend some time at the feet of Jesus. I can't get nobody to help me. I just need to know, do I have any men that's willing to spend some time at the feet of Jesus? The other one I want to talk about, amen, praise the Lord, is his faith. The 23rd verse, he besought him greatly, saying, my daughter, my little daughter, lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay hands on her that she may be healed and she shall Live. That's faith. Uh huh. Jairus was confident that Jesus could bring healing to his daughter. She was at the point of death, but he knew that Jesus had the power to overcome any problem. And so notice the extent of his faith. Notice the extent of his faith. He said, She shall not might. She shall not might. She shall not maybe. She shall live. I can't get nobody to help me. J.I. was aware. That the situation was dire and bleak. J. Iris was aware that the circumstances and situation was beyond his control. There was nothing he could do. There was nothing his position could buy. There was nothing his prestige could get, his prestige could get him. There was nothing he could do no matter how desperately he tried. He learned to trust in Jesus. He learned to trust in the Lord. Can I keep talking for the things that he could not provide. Uh-huh. And so I'm glad that God likes to work where nothing else can work. Uh-huh. I like that when God loves to work where nothing else can. Uh-huh. When we, a man, face situations within our families that are beyond our control. Oh, I will be talking. Uh-huh. And that they are many. I want you to trust in the Lord. I want you to trust in Jesus. Uh, he never fails. Amen. I'm glad there is hope. Uh-huh. For those who believe in faith. Amen. Uh, honor Jesus with your faith. Uh, uh-huh. Respect Jesus with your faith. Uh, expect him to do the unexpectedly. Uh, expect him to do the impossibility. Uh, uh, glory to God. I'm talking about what kind of faith is this? Uh-huh. Uh, glory to God that J. Iris will lay aside. Oh, yes. Uh, uh-huh. His position he laid aside. His job title. Amen. To get to Jesus. Uh, I need to know, fathers, what is, laid, what is hindering you from humbling yourself? Uh, what is preventing you from getting to the feet of Jesus? Can I keep talking here? Uh, another thing I want to know about the quality of a father. Uh, a godly father is persistent. I can't get nobody to help me, huh? There's no one talking about how you're going to pay your rent because the money been spent. Because a father is persistent, uh huh? J. Iris had made it to Jesus, huh? But they weren't home. They home yet, amen. Huh? And as they begin to make their way through the crowd to go to J. Iris' house, 
Uh huh. The Bible doesn't record everything that J.I. was and them was communing as they journeyed back home, but I'm sure they had some tense moments there. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Time was of essence. Uh huh. Time was of the essence. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. Because his daughter was laying at the point of death. Amen. Uh -huh. The daughter was one foot away from dying. Amen. Uh -huh. oh, glory to God. Amen. Uh -huh. His daughter may not make it until they arrive. Uh -huh. You got to understand the urgency of getting to Jesus. Huh? And fathers, I want you to understand huh, if your children are going to be saved, huh, you've got to get to the feet of Jesus with some urgency. Huh? you got to plead the blood. Amen. Huh? I know some of our children may have gone huh, contrary to the word that we brought them up in. Huh? But long you did what Jesus said huh, to train up the child in the way they should go. Huh? I don't care if they stray away. Amen. Huh? There's the hook in the mouth that can't get away from. Huh? Oh Lord huh? and all you got to do is say find them. Huh? Reel my son back in. Huh? Reel my daughter back in. Huh? Holy Ghost get a hold of them now huh? in the face of great difficulty. Huh? Jairus remained true to his faith huh? in the face of Shonda huh? in the face of great difficulty. Huh? I need to know do I have any godly fathers huh? that's going to remain true to the faith. Huh? Come hell or high water. Huh? I'm not going no way. Huh? I'm staying with Jesus. Huh? I come shunned him. Huh? Thank you, Holy Ghost. Huh? He was persistent huh? in his pursuit, amen, huh? of the healing of his daughter. Huh? And I need to know, do I have any persistent fathers huh? that's out there, amen, huh? persistent, amen, huh? persistent enough to pray, huh? persistent enough to fast huh? on behalf of your sons and your daughters. Huh? I'm like Job said. Huh? Can I go to Job now? Huh? And I know we got some Jobelines out there. Huh? But Job said, huh? and Job the first chapter, huh? oh, glory to God. Huh? He said, it may be my sons have sinned huh? and cursed God in the heart. Huh? But you find Job, amen, huh? making sacrifice on behalf of the children. Huh? Other words, I'm not giving them up. Huh? I'm not giving them over to the devil. Huh? I come to encourage you fathers, huh? don't give your sons and daughters huh? over to the devil. Huh? But pray Oh, glory to God. Every now and then, you may have to cry sometimes, but that's all right. I know Jesus, he will fix it after a while. I had to lay awake that night, but that's all right. I know Jesus will fix it after a while. I'm talking about the persistency of a godly father. Don't give up on your sons. Don't don't give up on your daughters. Huh? God, huh? I said, God, huh? God is able huh? to do exceedingly, huh? abundantly, huh? above all that we ask huh? or even think. Huh? I want to encourage you fathers huh? as well as your mothers. Huh? Don't give up on your child. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes. And so this text reveals three areas huh, that faith has tested. Huh? This text reveals three areas huh, that Jairus' faith was tested, huh, and yet he yet persisted. Huh? I want you to know your faith huh, is going to be tested. Huh? Your Lord and God huh, is going to be tested. Huh? I remember, huh, can I preach up in here? Huh? I remember my son huh, was born with a kidney disease. Huh? They did not expect him to live. Huh? They they told my wife and I huh, that most babies born with that disease huh, are born dead. Huh, are glory to God. Huh, or they die huh, within the first three days. Huh, but I want you to know, amen, huh, I had a relationship with God. Huh, can I keep talking here? Huh, I had a relationship with Jesus. Huh, I went to Jesus huh, just as I was. Huh, I was persistent huh, and I had faith. Huh, I had church folks huh, that was open my my son would die. Huh? No, he didn't. Huh? Yeah, I had those church folks, huh? those religious people huh? that was hoping he would die. Huh? I said, Father, huh? I went home. Huh? I had me a praise. Huh? Mother Johnson, huh? I had me a praise. Huh? I said, Father, 
I, I want to thank you for my son. Thank you for blessing me with my son. I asked you for my son. You blessed me with my son. And I just want to take a few moments to tell God thank you. Oh, glory to God. After I praised him, after I worshiped him, gave him glory for my son. I said, now, Lord, if you let my son die, they're going to label me a false prophet. They're going to label me a false preacher. I said, now, Lord, for your name's sake, heal, heal my son. I come to tell you, the third day, they got a teaspoon of urine from my son. I said, that's a clown of the size of a man's hand. I wanted you to know it's going to rain. Can I preach up in hell? So the third day, his kidneys started functioning. One, his lungs wasn't fully developed, but I had a petition. I had a relationship with God. God blew in that left lung, inflated that lung, amen. My son is 32 today and still breathing. I can't get nobody to help me. I'm talking about the persistency of a God the Father. Can I preach up in him? Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. My son stayed in the hospital. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, his, 20, his first 21 days on earth. Uh, he spent 21 days in the hospital. Uh, but I reminded uh, how Daniel prayed uh, for 21 days. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, on the 21st day, uh, my son got delivered uh, out of the hospital. Uh, I want to tell you, uh, there's a good Boshanda, uh, the God of Boshanda, uh, the quality of a godly father. Uh, a father uh, will lay aside his position a father will throw out the title and call on the name of the Lord I feel like preaching a glory to God you got to have faith a glory to God I'm so glad my hope is built in nothing less than Jesus blood and his righteousness and so what this text revealed to us three areas yet your faith is going to be tested one of the areas your faith is going to be tested huh, is the time of delay. Huh? Jairus went to Jesus huh, and much people followed him and thung him. Huh? And in the verse we did not read, huh, there was a count of a woman huh, that had an issue of blood. I huh? oh, thank you, Lord. Huh? While Jesus huh, and Jairus huh, was on the way to Jairus' house, huh, here come a woman huh, that had an issue of blood. Huh? Thank you, Lord. Huh? Intercepted huh? interrupted huh, the possession of God huh, oh Lord huh, and Jesus huh, as he was walking huh, he said who huh, who touched me huh, thank you Lord huh. the disciples said Lord huh, how in the world huh, you asking who touched you huh, with all these folks out here huh, you want to know who touched you huh, but Jesus recognized huh, that somebody touched him huh, with the finger of love huh, somebody touched him with the finger of faith. Thank you, Lord. Can I keep on preaching? Thank you, Lord. And so what happened? Although we didn't read it, huh, she had come with a great need. Huh? This woman with the issue of blood, huh, she came with great need. Huh? But while Jesus huh, was ministering to her, huh, there was a delay huh, in getting to Jairus' daughter. Huh? I come by to tell you, huh, every delay huh, is not a denial. <coughs> Every delay is not a denial. His faith remained persistent in the delay period. Huh? And there's some delay periods in our life. Huh? There's going to be time when things are delayed in our life. Huh? But I love Jairus. Huh? His faith remained persistent huh? in the season of delay. Huh? There's something you've been praying for. Huh? There's something you've been waiting on. Huh? There's a blessing you've been waiting for. Huh? It's on the way. Huh? It's just been delayed. Huh? But every delay huh? is not a denial. Huh? Thank you, Lord. Huh? He had placed his need. 
feet uh, in the hand of Jesus uh, and fully trusted uh, Jesus to provide for his daughter. Uh, we must learn uh, this great truth. Uh, God doesn't work uh, when we think he needs to work. Uh, God is not on our time schedule. Uh, God does not work uh, when we think he should. Uh, there are times uh, when we feel that God is delayed. Uh, you know Martha, uh, she told Jesus, uh, had you been here a few days ago, uh, my brother would not have died. Uh, glory to God. Uh, but every delay uh, is not a denial. Uh, can I preach up in hell? Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, yes, Lord. Uh, there are times uh, when we feel that God has denied uh, or has forgotten our request. Always remember that a delay doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily mean a denial. God works in his time and God is never late. I feel like preaching up in here. We may not always understand what God is doing in our lives, but we must trust Jesus in those times when it seems that nothing is happening on our behalf. Let me go back to Daniel's. Daniel's the 10th chapter. He said it's all to seek the Lord. He chose to fast for 21 days to get an answer for the Lord. During those 21 days, there was a spiritual battle that was taking place in the stratosphere. There was a spiritual battle that was taking place in the hemisphere. Unbeknownst to Daniel, uh huh. let's go to Daniel the 10th chapter for you all don't know. Unbeknownst to Daniel, there was a war going on. And so when Michael gets to Daniel, can I get there right quick? When Michael finally reached Daniel, can I preach here today? He said in 12th verse, he said, fear not, Daniel, from the first day that I did set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before the Lord, thy words were heard and I was dispatched to come to you. You got to understand the day you set your heart to see God and inquire of the Lord, God heard your prayers. The Bible says in Isaiah, before you call, I will answer. While you're yet praying, I'm going to speak. And so we find here, but the prince of the kingdom withstood me one in 20 days. And lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, I had to get some backup. Every now and then, when you're going through your, your rock every now and then when you're going through your spiritual battle, you need to get some backup. You need that brother or that sister to help pray with you. He said, but, uh, but lo, Michael, one of the chief prince, came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. And now I have come to make thee to understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. And so you got to understand, amen, praise the Lord. Do not, do not despair in the time of denial. So here, like I said, we find, amen, praise the Lord, uh-huh, that there are times, uh-huh, when things are going to be delayed. But during these times, this is going to reveal three areas of our faith. The first area of our faith is the time of delay. The second area of our faith is the time of despair. In the 35th, 36th verse, while he yet speak, after he got finished taking care of the one with the issue of blood, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter is dead uh-huh why troubles thou the master thy daughter is dead amen so why bother to continue to trouble the master amen and so we find out amen as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. Fear not, believe only, she shall be made whole. Amen. A Jairus, a patiently waiting on the Lord, waiting on Jesus, heard some dreadful news. His daughter had died. He had done all he could do. He had done all he could and she was gone. Those who brought the news were saying she is dead. There's no need to further burden Jesus any longer. 
But Jairus remained persistent in his faith. In the time of your despair, you need to remain persistent in your faith, fathers. Don't give up on your daughters. Don't give up on your sons. Amen. Praise the Lord. You got to understand, I've been a father for 34 years, raising three girls and two boys. I didn't have my heart cut out and served to me on a platter. But I'm still standing. I can't get nobody to help me. Fathers, remain persistent in your faith. He stays with Jesus, determined that he can provide. And as he stood there, Jesus said, be not afraid, only believe. That means keep on believing. There's no limit to what faith could do. What God done for others, he could do for you. Oh, there's no limit what faith and the power of God can do. When we, we will all face those difficult times of despair. And when it seems all oh, hope is lost. These are not the times to abandon our faith in Jesus. And so in Mark 9 and 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believeth. We need men of faith. We need men, godly men of faith who trust in God in every situation. I'm going to say it again. In every situation. I remember... I was going through some, some time. The repo man was calling me. Amen. I called my friend, Brother Harris. I said, look here, brother. I might have to stash my car over at your house. I can't get nobody to help me. I know y'all never done nothing like that. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I wasn't in God's perfect will at the time. I was in God's permissive will. Amen. Praise the Lord. But I did not let my family know what was going on. I was still believing God. Even though I got myself in the mess, I believe God to deliver me from the stress. I can't get away to help me. And so we see here, Jesus said, look here. Only believe, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. And so in time of despair, when things look dismal and bleak, don't lose faith. The third thing is a time of doubt. Uh-huh. 38 through 40 says, he come into the house of the ruler of the synagogue and he see the turmoil and them that wept and wailed greatly. Verse 39, and when he was come in, he said unto them, why make it this ado? Why are you making a big thing out of this and weep? The damsel not dead, she just sleep. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, the doubters, the naysayers, the unbelievers, when he had put them all out, he taken the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered into the damsel where the damsel was laying. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so when they arrived home, a group of mourners he had already gathered. Word had already went out. And you know, that's something how fast word traveled. And they didn't have modern technology. They didn't have no cell phones. But there was always a group of mourners already there. <laughs> Jesus proclaimed that she isn't dead, only sleep. And with that, people began to laugh and mock the power of Jesus Christ. Clearly, they didn't have the faith that J. Iris possessed. In other words, brothers and sisters, People are not always going to have the faith that you possess. Do not allow, allow anyone to diminish your faith. You godly fathers, do not allow anybody to diminish your faith. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it appears like. Do not allow anybody to diminish your faith. They haven't spent any time at his feet like J. Ivers did. They haven't heard his voice of comfort like J. Ivers did. They haven't seen the miracle that Jesus had just performed like J. Ivers did. So J. Ivers is still persistent in his faith. He has determined to trust in Jesus no matter who else does. And I'm glad that my faith isn't dependent upon the attitude and the opinions of others. Is your faith dependent upon the attitude and the opinions of others? And so you got weak faith. Uh-huh. The world may look at your situation and declare that there is no hope. They looked at my son's situation and declared that there was no hope. They did not realize my son possessed a praying mother. My son possessed a praying father. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. And so, but keep on trusting in Jesus. Amen. They don't know what you know. They haven't labored in your prayers. They haven't heard his words comfort to you. They know nothing of the power of God we serve. And I'm confident in my Lord's ability to meet all of my needs. And then as I close, as I come, I'm trying to close, I'm trying to close. A father's privilege. He took the damsel by the hand. This is a father's privilege. 
He took the damsel by the hand and said to her, Tell her to come here. Which being inter interpreted, damsel, I said unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel rose and walked, for she was age of twelve. And they were astonished with great astonishment. That is a father's privilege. What began as a day of despair, a day of uncertainty, has ended in a day of deliverance, a day of rejoicing, and a day of celebration. Jesus has raised their only daughter from the dead. And as I considered this message today, as I considered the passage of scripture we just read, I was mindful of the role that J. Iris, the godly father, played in the healing of his daughter. He was a man of influence before a lot of people in the synagogue, but on this day, he was a man of influence of his own home. Uh-huh. His daughter was raised up because of her encounter with Jesus. But Jairus was the key of her meeting the master. Did I get that? Uh huh. Other words, fathers, your ch you are the key of your children meeting the master. The master is Jesus. I can't get nobody to help me. He, had he not sought out the Lord, she likely would have been buried, separated from the family. Because of his commitment to his family, his faithful, as, as faithfulness as being a father, his daughter has been given life again. Did y'all get that? Did y'all get that? That's prophetic. I'm going to say it again. That's prophetic. Did y'all get that? Because of his commitment to his family as a faithful father, his daughter had been given life. What I'm saying to you, fathers, your commitment to God, your faithfulness to your family is going to bring, brother Shonda, is going to bring life, breathe life into your children. Men, that is a profound truth for you and me. We have been given the glorious privilege to father our children. What a blessing it is to be a positive influence in their life. We need to do all that we can to assure that our children, our children, have, have a, an encounter with Jesus. Every child needs to feel the touch of the master hand and be raised from a life of sin, born again into a family of God. There is no greater privilege to see our children come to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. We need, amen, we need to be all that we can be for the Lord. Is that all right? So that they can see Jesus in us and desire what we have. One thing I always let my children know, I did not get to where I'm at today of my own. This is of the Lord's doing. Uh-huh. And it's marvelous to the eyes. I'm sure that J.I.R.'s daughter remembered his love and concern for her more than the position he had in the synagogue. What were our children, fathers? Fathers, I'm talking to you, fathers. What were your children? What were our children remember about us? Six things as I close, six things as I close, a godly father does. Uh-huh. Uh huh. A, fa a godly father keeps growing. I'm going to say it again. There's six things that a godly father does. Number one, a godly father keeps growing. You got some fathers out there that don't even go to church no more. Uh oh. I didn't mean to step on your toes, fathers. Men lead. I'm going to say it again. Men lead. Uh huh. Even if I was not pastoring today, you will still find me in church going to Sunday school, Bible study, joy night. Amen. I just, I'm just addicted. I can't get nobody to say, oh, shot. I am addicted to the ministry of the saints. But a godly father keeps growing. A man can only be an effective father as he continues to grow spiritually. Our marriage, our parenting will be impacted by our sins or our lack of sins. I'm going to say again. Our marriage and our parenting will be impacted by our sins or the lack of our sins. Or by the lack of our, mat our maturity or our maturity. Uh-huh. We will be impatient if, if we will be impatient, temperamental, rude, thoughtless, and respond simply to being sinned against. So our only option is to keep growing in holiness and in sanctification. Putting to death the sin of our lives and growing in Christ-like maturity will have a practical effect on the way we lead our homes. This means that fathers must spend time in the Bible. Hello? We must spend time in prayer, actively seeking to walk in obedience by the power of God. And since we believe the gospel to be the only infallible written word of God, 
not only justifies us before God, but also is the means by which we grow as believers. We ought to meditate on the truth, on the word of God, of the gospel, and live remembering who we are and whose we are. When we see sin in our lives, we must repent. And seek to grow. Hebrews 12, 1 B said we got to lay aside every sin in the way, every weight in sin that so easily what? Beset us. When we see immaturity and foolishness in our lives, we take steps to grow maturity and wisdom. The work we have been called to as fathers and husbands is too important for us to take a vacation. Too important for us to become lackadaisical. Amen. Toward our walk towards Jesus. The second thing, a godly father loves his wife. If my son is going to learn how to love their wives, they're going to learn how to love their wives by my example. I can't get nobody to help me. Uh-huh. If my son see me slapping and beating the wife, my wife, then they're going to grow up thinking that's, that's the norm. You're supposed to slap and beat your wife. So godly fathers have to love their wives. Men, before the call to parent our children is the call to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. I can't get nobody to help me now. When we, 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 can so center, when we, we can so center our home on our children, they will neck out, neck, neck our marriage. And, neck, neck, and they neck like a marriage will become an unhappy marriage. And vice versa. When children start coming, the mother can, so, 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 can be uh, uh, unbeknownst to her. She can start focusing on the children and neck, neck the husband. Vice versa, when the children come, the father can neck, neck the wife and focus on the children. There has to be balance. All of our parenting efforts can be undone when resentment and hurt builds up between the wife and the husband. We need time together with our wives, without our children. Uh oh, I'm going to say it again. Fathers, we need time together with our wives, without our children. You know, you got to have a date night. I can't get nobody to help me. You know who that, who that, who that, who that, Jacob? Jacob was Scott sporting his wife. Give me that scripture right quick. You know, I don't know why y'all men get married and then forget how to date your wives. Amen. Praise the Lord. His wife's name was Rebecca, right? Amen. We find that Jacob was sporting his wife. And fathers, amen, even though you're a father, you're still a husband. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we find that in the Bible, amen, that Jacob was sporting, amen, his wife. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, amen. Uh, and so it, as, as, as men, we got to understand that because the children come along, amen, praise the Lord, we are not exempt from doing what God has called us. So let's go to Genesis 26, Genesis 26, verse 8. The latter part, so, oh, oh, I said Jacob, it's Isaac. Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. You mean to tell me this brother was still sporting his wife? Yeah, Isaac was strutting down the sidewalk, strutting down the street with his wife in arms and tow. Amen. Praise the Lord. So husbands, you, amen. When the children come along, do not neglect your wives. Amen. Day nights will prove to be important, especially when children are coming along. You still got to keep your date nights in this, when the children are young. It can be freeing to get out of the house and have a meal without having to feed another person. Or also give your, you something to look forward to to come home. Now, it, it, now I got the help. I got the help. I'm not going to say this right now. But however, as great a date night is, time together every day is, is a great importance. So just as you can't work out once a month and expect to be in shape, you shouldn't expect one date night a month to be sufficient in growing your marriage. Okay? Did y'all get that? Do I need to say it again? I'm going to say it again. Amen. However, as great a date night is, time together every day is greater of importance. Just as you can't work out once a month and expect to be in shape, you shouldn't expect one date a night, uh, one date night a month to be sufficient for growing in marriage. Get your children in bed or in the rooms at a decent hour so you all can talk, read together, watch a movie together, and simply hang out in the same room. I can't get nobody to help me. This will give you the time together you so desperately need for your marriage to grow and flourish and give you joy. A godly father, number three, a godly father teaches consistently. Moses tells fathers to talk to the children about the commandments and statutes of the Lord as they sit in their houses and walk by the way. He uses this rhetorical, uh, rhetorical device 
to underscore the necessity of fathers teaching their children in every instance of life. The wise father will see all of life as an opportunity to teach his children about the gospel, walking with Jesus in practical wisdom. Family devotion are not only ways for a father to teach his children. Amen. Praise the Lord. One thing I enjoyed with my children, I still enjoy today, amen, is get on the PlayStation. Amen. We, I think we started out with the Nintendo. Yeah, it was the Nintendo. Then went to the PlayStation. Then went to the Xbox. We're back at the PlayStation again. But you, I'm talking about family devotion are not all the only way. Amen. Family devotion are not the only way for a father to teach the children. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. These times of worship as a family don't require hours of preparation or a sermon. But just a simple word from the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And plain. Amen. Praise the Lord. I don't know if I got, I mean, how many fathers got to watch me. But sit down and play some Madden. With your son. I can't get over. Help me. Get the Tekken game out. Play with your son. Get your children some uh, loving memories. Now, my baby girl, Rebecca, I don't, you know, she, she kills me every time I play her in the NBA sports. Amen. Praise the Lord. She just thrashes me. You know, but I still play her because it's not all about winning. It's about spending quality time as a father. Is that all right? And so a father teaches consistently. So you're teaching your children. It's not always about winning. Is about just enjoying family. Is that all right? Uh huh. What am I, number four now? A godly father disciplined patiently. The joy and pain of parenting. There are some highs and there are some lows when it comes to parenting. It was an extended meditation of Proverbs 29, verse 17. Amen. You got to understand as a parent, you're going to have some highs and you're going to have some lows. But all of my good days outweigh my bad days. <clears throat> and I won't complain. Proverbs 29, verse 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give, the, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Discipline your son. He will give you rest. He will give you delight in your heart. Constantly teaching, correcting, the discipline of children can be exhausting sometimes. But it's necessary. We can easily give in to the temptation, let them get away with it, let them, let them go, you know, we should address it later or whatever. And I remember growing up, and sometimes I think my mom then forgot, or sometimes I go to bed early, hoping she'll forget, and just to get shocked out of my sleep with a belt. I can't get nobody to help me. Amen. Praise the Lord. But there's joy and pain with parenting. We don't discipline our children because we want to. We discipline our children because we have to. It's a necessity. For them to learn right from wrong. And so instead we must patiently and consistently be, uh, discipline our children. When our children are wrong we need to be, and need to be disciplined, it is imperative that we take the time to calmly and patiently talk with them about what happened and why they're being disciplined. Rather than yelling and losing our tempers so that the kids are focused on our sins instead of their own. I can't get over help me. We have to take the time to calm down like Jesus did, like God did. God waited when Adam and Eve sinned. He waited till the cool of the evening. And if God had to wait till the cool of the evening, we're going to have to wait till we cool down too. Is that all right? We should talk with them about the foolishness of sinful or what they did. What the scripture says about what they have done. Amen. I remember one of my children had problems. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep them quiet in school. I had to take them to the scripture where it says, study, be quiet. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know some of y'all didn't know that was in the Bible. It says, study, be quiet it's in Thessalonians. So take time. Take, this it takes time and, and definitely is not the easy way out, but it will train the heart of our children and be better for them in the long run. Fathers, another thing, a father, the next one is a father, a godly father repents when he is wrong. When you as a father can never admit you're wrong, something's wrong with you already. Amen. And there's been times in my life I had to go to my children and ask them forgive me, forgive me for acting out of haste. So what I said to you and the way I said it was wrong. Will you forgive me? I don't know that there is any more difficult thing for a father to say to his children. But we will sin against our children at some point in our parenting, either through losing our temper, accusing them falsely, speaking harshly, or in a thousand other ways. And when we sin against our children, the same way we must to repent to the Lord, we need to repent to our children. Because there's no perfect father out here, contrary to popular belief. 
we need to ask them to forgive us. We acted out of haste, and I have, to do, I have had to do this several times, so I'm not telling you something I have not had to do. The greatest temptation fathers will face is when it comes to apologizing to your children. I never had a problem apologizing to my children because I wanted them to understand, I, that's because I'm the father, I am not always right. I can't get nobody to help me. And don't, when you go and repent to them, don't be trying to justify your action. You was wrong, plain and simple. Resist this urge with everything you have because you sin, and that is all that matters. And repenting and asking for forgiveness is the model that they will remember. Amen? The last one is that God the Father know he needs to pray for, of the Holy Ghost. Men, if we, won't, amen, if we have just talked about sound like hard work, we got to get up in the morning and go to work during the day. Come home to play with and spend time with our children and then get them to bed so we can spend time with our wives. Then we fall into the bed ourselves so we can get up and get back to work as usual. It doesn't make a man for any interesting reality show, but this is a self-giving and central to what means it means to be a father and a husband. A godly father knows he needs to pray because we must work hard and give ourselves in a way that is not natural to us. We need the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We need his help to stay encouraged. We need his help to love and to exercise self-control and to make our, make our labor effective because we cannot change the heart of our children. And as Paul said, we labor in the strength of God that God provides and pray that we would use his, our labor in our home to change our children's lives and to bring glory to God himself. Father, in the name of Jesus we thank you for the word on today. And Lord, we thank you because being a godly father in an ungodly world is challenging. Raising godly children in an ungodly world remains a challenge, but yet you have given us that responsibility. And Lord, as we live in this crazy and mixed up society that is often anything but godly, we pray that you help us as fathers to live that quiet and meekness life before our children. Lord, we pray that as our children look on us, they see Jesus in us. It's our prayer as fathers that we don't do anything that would misrepresent our Heavenly Father. So God, we come to you today as men of God, asking you to help us to be the men of God you're calling us to be, help us to be the fathers to our children you're calling us to be, and help us to be the husband to our wives you require of us. In the name of Jesus, bless every father, that's listening under the sound of my voice, encourage the hearts on today. Thank you for attending this awesome service. The women of Be Ye Holy Ministries are hosting our Breaking Free Revival, featuring Evangelist Frazier of Topeka, Kansas, from 24 June to 26 June at 7.30 p.m. nightly, culminating on 28 June at 11.30 a.m. Please join us via Facebook or YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page and select the bell symbol so you'll be notified when we go live. Again, on behalf of Pastor Joe L. Newsom and First Lady Annette Newsom, thank you for attending. Come fellowship with us again and may God bless you. <laughs>